figured out. I believe we're going to be able to do it, but uh, uh, I was going to, it involves using an iPad and trying to put it through the screens, and I think we, we've done it, but I believe we had to have a, uh, another device, which we have access to, and that won't be a problem. But I just wanted to see, make sure I could do it before I purchase my next uh, thing that I, I want to be able to use. And I uh, was going to do that, and Barbara Hale has an iPad. She has it all the time. So she came in, and uh, I said, Barbara, do you have your iPad? And she says, no. And I was like, well, that's a bummer. But anyway, she said, because if I need a Bible, she said, well, I've got my Barbara, what would you say you had? She said she's got her phone. Is anybody, and she's got it out right now, she's got her Bible out. Is anybody in here older than Barbara Hale? Now, Barbara's 27. So anybody here that's older, I just think that's, that's, that's a sign of the times, is it not? I mean, when, uh, you know, <laughs> it wasn't just a few years ago, I was holding a gospel meeting up at the Tracy City Congregation, and uh, I had a brother, when I had started my lessons, uh, the computer that I had done it on was different than the one that I was showing it on. And so sometimes back in those days when you would uh, do such things, it wouldn't quite line up right on the screens as it had before. And so I apologize because some of it went off the screen. You know, some of it went off into another little window a little bit. And I said, you know, I'm sorry about that. I, I probably should have looked at that. I did not. So I apologize. It wasn't anything that you couldn't, you know, get through. I mean, you could still read it. It just wasn't as pretty as it had been. And, and an old, older brother on the way out the door says, he said, I appreciate your lesson and everything. He said, but you know, if uh, the Lord had wanted the Bible on computer, he had to put it on computer. And I said, that's, that's, that's good advice right there. That's, that's good. And he went on. Because I didn't want to tell him, you know, that the Lord has, and I have about 15 of them on this little thing I've got, you know. But um, that just shows, you know, we, we do live in changing times. And some folks, uh, uh, I still like... Uh, I, I still like my paper copy, but uh, at Bible camp, I don't even like to take my Bibles out of my bag just because they get wet and things of that nature. So I'm pretty much all electronic up there, even preached. Uh, I don't know if the girls even notice or not, but I use my iPad to preach up there, and I don't ever really do that. I'm uh, going to try to start doing that more, though. Well, all that to say this, we're still contending earnestly for the faith. We're not in Jude. We're in Timothy. Well, we're going to take a look at what it takes for the task, and we're going to begin by looking at, let's go ahead and look at the first three verses. You'll have plenty of time to fill those in, by the way. It says in chapter 2, verse 1, Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Great verse, probably so many of you have it committed to memory or know it, you know, you know that verse. And then the verse that follows it, well, brethren, that's where we get our authority for the Memphis School of Preaching for the East Tennessee School of Preaching, for the Chattanooga School of Preaching, for the Southwest School of Preaching, for the Florida School of Preaching, for Tennessee Bible College, for uh, Faulkner, uh, you know, back in the day when it was mostly just all uh, Alabama School of Religion, you know, those uh, colleges and things. And you might say, because that came up, you know, is it right to send money to a preaching school? Well, well, notice what it says here in verse 2. And the things that thou hast heard of me, this is Paul talking to Timothy, commit the same, or the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. Therein lies a command that we're to teach, and we're to can teach, and we're to teach what we have heard before. And in, the, of course, the Bible, we're to teach the Bible. And so there we're in, we have the authority to have a preaching school. We have the authority to sit one right up here in South Pittsburgh if we so desire. And uh, that is from whence you can say Paul tells Timothy here to commit the same to faithful men. And so if that means you need a building, you need a building. If that means you need the equipment to do that, radio facilities, things of that nature, if you're going to do that, then, uh, you know, the authority is there for it. You take what you've learned and you use this. We're going to begin now and pretty much on our sheet here, what it takes for the task, and we're going to look at the positive side, it'll be on the left, and the things that are kind of negative, more ne negative connotation on the right side. Now, the things you're going to see immediately following this, don't write those down, that's not what it goes with. 
what you have are the main points, but each one of these is going to have a sub point. So uh, you'll see I left enough on the blanks there so you can figure out it wasn't what I was to do. Well, look, notice at verse 3. Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that warreth entangle himself with the affairs of this life that he may please him who hath chosen him or called him to be a soldier. First of all, the idea of fearlessness to fight. A soldier is trained to fight. Not that he doesn't uh, have anxiety, not that he isn't afraid, but the fact that he is going to set that aside and go out and do his job, what he's been trained to do. And there's a great deal of discipline that comes in with, with that, and I know that I've spoken of this a, a lot, uh, because that is the difference between your Western armies and uh, Brother Joe back there, he can testify to this. It's the difference between your Western armies and what you find a lot of times in the Middle East, save some armies, for instance, like Israel. They find kind of uh, go on a Western kind of mindset, and that is they put their soldiers through very rigorous training, very disciplined training, training that sometimes doesn't even make sense. Uh, you know, why are we doing this? Well, it's to install discipline so when the time comes, you will do your job, uh, you know, out of responsibility, realizing it may even cost you your life. Uh, that is just you just you learn to react more than so much as the thinking process will this hurt me that's one of the reasons brethren that the Arabs armies when the Israelis the six day war if you they conquered like three times the size of their country in a little over six days because they were just walking through those Arab armies those Arab armies weren't really used to facing death and when it came time to either use that weapon or run uh, they chose to run. You remember the same thing took place with the Iraqi Republican Guard. When they had an opportunity to exercise those weapons, uh, they tried to get those weapons out of Dodge. They tried to run with them. Hopefully they'd get away and we could have a ceasefire and they could use those to manipulate their little Arab brothers later on. But as you remember, we took the 24th Infantry Division behind them and just walked right through them. And uh, so there's a difference there. The soldier he's talking about here is a disciplined Roman soldier, one who is... Fearless to fight, but not that he's not scared, but that he'll overcome that fear and he'll continue to move on. So fearlessness to fight and the freedom to fight. One of the things that we do in our country, and we're strong about this, it's something that comes up just about every election. The military always gets used as a tool, but we always emphasize that we need to take care of our soldiers, that we need, they don't need to be thinking about, well, not, do my kids have enough to eat at home when they're out in the desert somewhere, you know, getting shot at. Uh, they need to be secure in the fact that if something even happens to them, that their families will be taken care of. Rather than to be quite honest with you, I had no idea that uh, we just didn't give soldiers' families money anyway when they died. When I enlisted in the Army, they said, you'll need to take out this SGLI. Everything in the Army is an acronym, <laughs> you know, and I'm like, well, what is SGLI? They said, well, that is service members group life insurance. And I'm like, well, what do we need life insurance for? I mean, if we get killed, don't they give, you know, don't they bury us and, you know, send our folks, uh, you know, some money, you know? And it's like, no, they don't. Uh, and so you take out SGLI. Yes, they would bury you probably, but as far as, uh, you know, a, a lump sum going to your family to help take care of immediate needs, that wasn't addressed. You know, that's one of the things, you remember when the, uh, there I am talking. I probably don't need to mention that. But, you know, where the trade towers got ran into by the two airplanes, remember how many millions of dollars we allotted the families of the folks that died in those buildings? And if you'd been a soldier in the Army, I mean, some families were getting several million dollars because their loved one had died up there. But do you realize we had soldiers in the field that if they had died, their families would have got the $50,000 SGLI. I think it's 100000 now. Joe, you got out a lot sooner than, later than I did. How much did it go to? 400,000, boy, I'm glad my wife didn't know about that. I'd have been in there, and man, she'd have had me volunteering for everything. Well, that's, that's about right, I would imagine, as far as inflation and things go. But he doesn't need to be thinking about that. So that's what's being said here. He doesn't worry about what's going, he doesn't need to worry about what's going on because it's going to affect his, and, and that's what we're talking about with preachers, with missionaries. When we send these guys out in the field, they need to know that they're out there doing the Lord's work and they're going to be taken care of. And that's exactly what's being spoken of here. So he needs freedom to fight. And notice also faithfulness to fight. He needs to be faithful to him that called him. Now, it's one thing when you're supporting a soldier 
And he goes off. You remember the fella? I don't know any of the circumstances. I'm just going to give you the what I heard. Remember there was a soldier we had that just walked off the job over there and apparently ended up in the enemy camp or something? I don't know all the details about that, but he, he just left. He left his post, and the next thing you know, uh, he's been captured or whatever. Um, you know, there was the idea, was he being faithful? What was his fidelity? Did he quit and go over the other side? And so all that came up. Well, you don't want a soldier like that. You want a soldier who's going to be at his post. I mean, that's one of your first general orders. I will not leave my post till properly relieved. You've got to learn that before they even let you out of the, the first day. So uh, there was, that was interesting. But you want a soldier who's doing his job. Who's, who, and so if we send somebody out in the field, if we send a missionary out in the field or we're going to support a congregation or we're going to support a work, we need to make sure, and we do, but, you know, that's part of it. You want to make sure he's faithful. You want to make sure he's teaching what you need to be taught. Well, we talk about you'll need the dedication, but also in this verse, it talks about the rigors. The rigors we're going into, and, and what is that? Well, just like soldiers, we're going to suffer. And Paul says in this epistle, you know, if any man, uh, you know, is going to live faithfully, he is going to suffer persecution. That just comes with it. So suffering is a part of it. And remember, He's using the illustration here of a soldier for a very good reason because we're in a war, brethren, and so there is going to be struggle. So those, that's the negative side of the dedication of a soldier. Notice next, the discipline of an athlete. The discipline of an athlete. That's what he says in verse 5. Uh, Helen, do you have a New American Standard Bible? Are you using the NASB? You're not? Okay. I could, does anybody, can anybody access that pretty quick? Or do I need to do it? Corey, do you have an NASB on yours? Let me, uh, because I, I just really appreciate the, the verbiage there. It's just how we would probably say it today. And so let me pull that up pretty quick. Meanwhile, Corey, would you read it in whatever version you have while I pull this up? Well, you know, in a nutshell, that's exactly what, uh, what this is going to say as well. But, you know, once you've already said you're going to do something, it makes you want to do it, so I'm going to try to do it. So what was that? 2 Timothy 1, 5, right? 2, 5, excuse me. I've even got it pulled up here, and I'm saying the wrong thing. All right. The New York Standard, and I think this is just about what you just read, it says, if anyone competes as an athlete, that's what he's talking about here, Striving for masteries, we might just miss that today. We don't talk like that. So if anyone competes as an athlete, he does not win the prize unless he competes according to the rules, which I think is pretty much what the ESV said as well. That's a little clearer for us, I think, than if any man strives for the mastery. Striving lawfully, that's what he's saying. Striving lawfully means you're, you know, if you hit the ball, you're going to run to first base, not third. And, you know, uh, that's just so the discipline of an athlete and we're going to talk about the rules that he must comply to. So the positive aspect, you've got to discipline yourself like an athlete. The negative was, well, you've got to do, you've got to play by the rules. So with that being said, notice the rigors to endure. An athlete, of course, we realize they train. They have to push themselves, and so there's rigors involved, and you've got to obey the rules, and, and you do that because why? You're wanting a crown, or you're wanting a gold medal, or you're wanting to win the football game. Or you're wanting to win the baseball game. And not only around here, uh, you know how South Pittsburgh is. It's not even about winning football games. I can't remember the last time they had a losing season. I don't know if they've ever had a losing season since I've been here. Uh, it's not about winning football games here. What's it all about in South Pittsburgh? Champ championships. What's it about in the SEC? It's about championships. You know, Alabama, they're, they're just not satisfied if they don't win the, the SEC and are playing for the championship. I mean, that's just... You know, the level you guys are, the Alabama fans, that's where y'all are at now. And the rest of us are chasing you, unless you're in Clemson. I think they got it last year, right? But still, that's expected, and that's what they want. That's why they're striving. That's why they're disciplining themselves. But notice the rules. These are set. You can't cheat. And unfortunately, the people in Ole Miss are having, <laughs> having to learn a new uh, lesson on that. It seems like all the time they... Uh, you know, there, people are getting caught breaking the rules, but I'll tell you something else. And I realize it's up to coach, up to the coach to know the rules. But have y'all ever seen some of these rule books? Corey, let me ask you something. You're coaching now. Have you ever read the ASA rule book? 
Oh, my word, it is that thick. And they talk about everything. There's only about five chapters in there that's even applicable. But, and then it's, you know, okay, here's the rule, but then here's the rule that covers that rule, and then you've got A, B, C, D, and then, you know, one, two, three. And so you're like, how are you even supposed to keep up with that? Well, it's a difficult thing to do. So some of those coaches, we may think, well, boy, they're just bad people. Hey, probably not so much. They don't even know what they are. Do you remember Nancy Pelosi a few years ago with the Health Care Act? Do you remember that? But, I mean, did y'all see that thing? And she says, well, let's pass it and find out what's in it. Well, that's not how you want to do it, you know. You kind of like to know what's in it before you pass it. But it, who reads that? Who reads that? Uh, and that, that's one of the reasons we're in the mess that we're in. Well, these rules that we're to go by, well, these are set. For the Christian, we know what our rules are. We have the Bible. Not only are they set, but they're known. We know the rules. And most of the time, if you have a general understanding of the game, uh, you're, you're going to be good. And so I've been in situations where I was talking with an umpire who had no idea what softball rules were, but yet, you know, there we were. <laughs> he was in charge of the game, and so you just kind of go, oh, you know, and walk back to the dugout and just sit there and say, you know, maybe someday he'll figure it out. But, and these must be kept. And uh, the, as a Christian, we have rules, and they, that we have a standard, and we need to live by those rules. Well, point number three, he goes and he uses another illustration. We have three great illustrations here, one of a soldier, one of an athlete, and now one of a farmer. And we're going to talk about the positive things that the farmer does, but we're also going to look at some of the negative things, or the negative aspect of it is it takes some time. First of all, the efforts of a farmer, it's strenuous, often back-breaking work. Now, I know today we've got some really great machines that can do a lot of the effort for us, but we had a, a fellow up at Cold Springs. His name was Wilbur Agee. Now, Wilbur walked just like this right here. He could not straighten. And he had a, another brother, and I mean physical brother, who was in the same exact situation. And, and everybody would just tell you, them two boys worked themselves to death. And everybody talk about back-breaking work. There were two illustrations because they spent from daylight to dark, you know. They were in the fields, and uh, their daddy, that's just how they grew up. That's what they did. And uh, it takes strenuous effort for a farmer. I think that's one of the reasons we appreciate farmers so much and, you know, use them. Uh, who's the guy? Uh, what what insurance company is that? You know, they have the farmer that does the state, is it, it's not state, Farm Bureau. <laughs> it's got farm in it. Farm Bureau, well, he's a farmer, you know. We trust farmers. I mean, they're hardworking, honest people, you know, and so that, there's a lot of effort involved. Notice a solitary effort. It, you know, it's a sole mission. It's something you're responsible for, and it's a steadfast effort. You just can't quit. You can't get the corn planted, and it starts coming up, and you just say, well, you know, I'm done with it, man. I've done all I'm going to do. No, you've got to keep working it. You've got to keep doing it to reap the harvest that you're shooting for. Well, First of all, the results of when you're patient, let's, let's, I should have read the text, I'm getting ahead of myself. The husbandman, that's King James, we would say farmer, that laboreth must be partaker of the fruits. He must be first partaker. He worked for it, it's his. Consider what I say now, and the Lord give thee understanding in all things. So, you know, one of the things Paul would bring up from time to time when it came up to, say, preaching and being compensated for that, as he'd say, the laborer is worthy of his wards. Here he uses the idea of the husband, the farmer that laboreth. He, he gets to eat of his food. Now, he may have to use some of that, sell some of that off, of course, pay his bills, things of that nature, but it's his. You know, he gets something from that, and that's his point here. And the thing we need to realize is, b bottom line, there's a work. And like farming, sometimes the results aren't instantaneous. You may water or you may plant another fellow may come along and water and another guy may come along and water and it may take somebody 20 years before they obey the gospel but guess what they obeyed the gospel and you had a part in that even though you never saw that you know it, it still took place and things aren't done overnight you know you can't uh, I remember uh, one time when I was in school we had to plant you know the little lima beans I don't remember what class it was but you had to plant the lima bean keep it in a little cup you know and I was so excited about that and anxious, you know, and I would check on that thing three or four times a day, you know. Well, that it didn't help me any. It's not going to grow any faster. But uh, there is a work, and you have to be patient. Not only is there a work, but there's also things that are going to hinder the work. There's weeds. Um, wouldn't you 
guys who have nice gardens and big gardens and really enjoy doing that, wouldn't you, wouldn't you like to know what it would have been like had Adam not caused God to curse the ground? I, I think that would be pretty interesting. I'd like to know more about that. But there are weeds. They're there, and you're going to have to deal with them. Well, in the spiritual aspect, you're going to have to do some weeding from time to time. Brethren will come up with ideas. Maybe they self-taught themselves somewhere. You know, maybe it's something you haven't covered. And they'll come up with ideas. And so you've got weeds growing around this perfectly good plant. And you don't want to just go in there and just attack it and destroy the plant. You've got to be gentle with it. You've got to work it. But you realize there are weeds and there's a work to be done. And then there's the waiting. There is the waiting. It's not something that's done overnight. It's not something you can just, it's going to, boom, there it is. It's, it's a work and it's a, it's a continuous effort. And there's the waiting aspect of it. I hope this person does this. You know, there's the praying. There's the time and uh, trying, trying to work them through that. So that, that's another illustration. You see the efforts of the farmer, but we also realize what takes place when we have the patience. Point number four, the confidence of the believer and the promise to rely on. So let's go ahead and read uh, these six verses. It says, Remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to my gospel, wherein I suffer trouble as an evildoer. People get after me about it. Even unto bonds, even put me in jail, he says. But the word of God is not bound. Therefore, he says, I endure all things for the elect's sake that they also may obtain or may also obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. He says, it is a faithful saying, for if we be dead with him, we shall live with him. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he will also deny us. So there's Matthew 10, 32 and 33, brought to life again, isn't it? And then verse 13, if we believe not, yet he cannot, except yet he abideth faithful, he cannot deny himself. So whether we continue to preach it or not, God's not going to deny himself. Well, let's look at this. First of all, the confidence of a believer, the example of Jesus. Jesus Christ, the seed of David, he was raised, he was raised, raised from the dead. And Paul says that he too has suffered trouble uh, as an evildoer, and yet he hasn't done anything evil. But why do they do that? Because the expectation of the hope. Jesus is raised. Paul says, God says, we too are going to be raised if we're faithful. Now, some negative things to go along with that, or actually this is positive, promises to rely on. Uh, our rising. Our rising from the dead. The Bible talks about a real, literal, literal bodily re resurrection. Now, what that body's going to look like, how all that's going to take place, I have no idea. And, uh, you know, there have been times in my Christian life where I was really disturbed by such things. Um, Stephanie's daddy, for instance, uh, was killed in a, in a battle in Asha Valley, Asha, however you pronounce it, and um, they were not able to recover the remains for months. And so, uh, you know, this was prior to DNA and all that, so basically you just kind of went off of, of uniform and dog tags and, and things of that nature. And so uh, I always thought about that because it wasn't, you know, a whole, you know, your, your bodies, it's, you know, messed up pretty good. Then you think about people that have been eaten by animals and things of that nature, and you think about a bodily resurrection. Well, how's that going to take place with, with them? Well, what really helps us is when we start thinking about what happens to this body. Dust returns to dust and spirit to God who gave it. So even if you embalm this bad boy and stick it in the ground uh, after a certain amount of time it's going to go the way of all the earth we're going to go all the way of all the earth and so there you answer the question you know God is able to take from dust and create man he's certainly going to be able to take from that same dust and recreate us but remember this body that we're going to have isn't like the body that we had before so that which is sown in incorrupt or in corruption is going to be reaped in incorruption so it's going to be Totally, totally different. So don't don't let that trouble you, as I let it a few times in my life, and just really didn't think it through. Uh, was mostly just kind of confused about it. But there will be a bodily resurrection. That being said, uh, 
that's one of the things, if somebody starts talking to you about that realized eschatology junk and no second coming of Christ and everything already, all prophecy being fulfilled on the other side of A.D. 70, just tell them, look, Paul is talking about something in 1 Corinthians 15. He's talking about a bodily resurrection. And in order to do that, you're going to have the First Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13 and following, when the trump of God shall sound and the voice of the archangel and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Uh, that's what all of that is talking about. It's just, I don't even know why brethren would even want to get off on something like that and then cause problems after they have. Well, promises to rely on, we're going to be raised. And we're going, not only are we going to be raised, but notice what he says with it. He says, it is a faithful saying, for if we be dead with him, verse 11, we shall live with him. If we die into Christ, blessed are they that die in the Lord, we're going to live with Christ. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he will also deny us. So two out of three, they're pretty negative, or pretty positive, excuse me, one negative. So we're going to reign, we're going to be resurrected, and so those are a couple of things that on the, uh, actually that's a positive uh, aspect. Notice uh, the skill of a workman, and then the duties that demand our best. This is verses 14 through 19. So let's go ahead and read these. <clears throat> it says, of these things, put them in remembrance. And remember the young man he is supposed to help train, the folks he's preaching to in Ephesus. Of these things we've just talked about, put them in remembrance, charging them before the Lord that they strive not about words to no profit, but the subverting of the he hearers. I tell you, the first thing, if I was going to talk about talk to somebody, and I wish I'd thought of this passage when I called Holger the first time and talked to him about how it's realized eschatology, A.D. 70 thing, because what's he just talking about? He just said, you know, if we're faithful, we're going to reign, live with him. Uh, if we suffer, we're going to reign with him. And he says, put people in, remember that. Remember that. And yet these, these brethren are going off on this tangent and obviously not remembering the, the clear verbiage here and charging them the, before the Lord to strive not about words to no profit. What in the world, if that is the case, what profit would it be to, to preach that? Uh, well, it's just, it's just not so. It is just not so. And, um, you know, you may have an idea about something, and I may have another idea about something. You know, and if it's not a matter of faith, which, by the way, this is, to realize eschatology is definitely about a matter of faith. But um, if it's not, you know, that's okay. But, you know, don't stand up and tell the whole world and try to preach that as doctrine and say, you've got to believe it too or that this is right. You know, that's why sometimes, brethren, I will tell you what this is what I think about this particular passage. Uh, like this morning with John 21 and the love there that's mentioned. You know, that, that's been my long study of that. Now, if you differ with that and you say, no, them other preachers was right, well, that, that's fine. There's no reason to withdraw from each other or anything over that. Not even really a, any reason to have a disagreement. Just, well, I think that's what that's teaching. You think that's what that's teaching. But, um, and that being said, here's why. Skill of a workman, uh, you've got to challenge this subverter. When you hear somebody's teaching out-and-out out false doctrine, it's going to cost men their souls, and you have a duty and obligation you need to speak up because what are they doing? Verse 14, they are subverting the hearers. And this word, it's kind of interesting, this word subverting. Hey, uh, Corey, what do you have there? Ruin? Because the, the Greek word there is catastrophe. Catastrophe. Does that remind you of anything? <laughs> Catastrophe, right? That's where we get our word. And so that's what that's saying. It's a, but you're, you're subverting them. What you're doing is catastrophic to them. And like Corey, the ESV there, it's ruining them. You know, you're teaching these folks are ruining, ruining, they're, you know, hurting them. And so then we have the verse so many of us could quote. It says, study to show thyself approved unto God. The American Standard has give diligence. Uh, that is our word spode, uh, which uh, study or give diligence to show thyself approved unto God. A workman that needeth not to be ashamed. There's our ashamed again. Rightly dividing the word of truth. Remember the whole thrust of chapter 1 is don't be ashamed. And here we're bringing it up again. Just out of curiosity, Corey, what does uh, verse 15 say there in the ESV? No, just the first part. Study to show thyself. Or... There's one approved. Eh, okay. Give diligence. Do your best. That's the idea. Okay, verse 16. But shun profane and vain babblings. Well, they will increase unto more uh, ungodliness. 
and their word will eat as doth a canker of whom is Hymenaeus and Philetus, uh, who concerning the truth have erred, saying the resurrection is past already. Does that remind you of anything? That's what we've just been talking about, isn't it? These brethren that we're talking about are, are in, guilty of this very thing. They're saying, well, that's past. That happened before uh, Jesus came. Uh, you know, uh, that happened before the, during the destruction of Jerusalem. That was the second coming. That was the uh, same thing. Amazing. It's past already and overthrow the faith of some. Nevertheless, the foundation of God stands sure. We have, to we have to have a skill now. We need to study to show ourselves approved. And what does that mean? Simply have the ammunition. Be ready to give a hope, uh, an apology, an apologia, the hope of the promise that lies within us. We need to be able to tell people, okay, listen, here's what the Bible says about that. So challenge the subverter and cut straight the word. That's the idea of cutting the claw straight, you know, uh, getting yourself prepared to do your best, as the ESV says there, to be able to preach it. Notice the duties demand our best. First of all, avoid useless things. Don't get into arguments with people about insignificant stuff that wouldn't matter a hill of beans if either one of you was right or wrong. You know, it's nothing to, to strive over. Now, if you want to talk about it, and there's nothing wrong with chasing rabbits or, you know, having your opinion on this, me having my opinion on that, but when we get start getting a little hot under the collar and saying, well, you ought to think like I do on this, uh, that's when we can, we don't need to do that. Avoid useless things. Apply self to proper things. There are things that we need to discuss, and we need to stay in that area. And then again, abstain from corrupt things, things that are going to, Hurt the body of Christ, uh, we need to stay away from those. Do the best we can stay away from that. Next point, cleanliness of a vessel and things that we separate or we get away from. Cleanliness of a vessel. Notice with me, if you will. The Lord knoweth them that are his, and every one that nameth the name of Christ departeth from iniquity. But in the great house here is going to say there are not only vessels of gold, and of silver, and of wood, and of earth, some to honor, and some to dishonor. So, I mean, you find that in any home, right? Even the temple would have some stuff that, uh, uh, you know, some, some made of wood, some made of silver. Usually the wood was covered with something, like gold or so forth. It says, if a man therefore purge himself of these, he shall be a vessel unto honor. In other words, those things we talked about a while ago, you don't need to have a part of. Uh, mixing words and things of that nature. It says, meat for the master is used prepared to every good work. Flee also youthful lust, follow after righteousness, faith, charity, peace, uh, with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart, but foolish and unlearned or unlearned questions avoid, knowing that they do gender strife. Something we have to be careful about, even, uh, you know, just sometimes getting into arguments over insignificant things. Notice, first of all, the cleanliness of a vessel. First of all, they're purged. You've got to get all the impurities out of it, purify it, set it apart, make it pure, and it's prepared. It's something that we have to do. We have to purge ourselves of bad things. We have to purify ourselves or make ourselves separate from the part for the master's use. How do we do that? Obey the gospel, walking in the light. We stay cleansed and so forth, and we need to be prepared. And that simply means it takes training. It takes us dedicating ourselves to, to be in the kind of vessel that we need to be for God. Notice the things that we separate. Wicked disciples. He's going to name a couple here in just a moment. Wrong doctrine or has named a couple already. Uh, wrong doctrine, worldly desires, youthful lust, things of that nature. Those are things that we need to, as we're trying to have this clean vessel, as we're trying to present ourselves pure before God, we need to purge these things uh, away, away from us, things we separate. And then last but not least, submission of a servant and service which we give. Submission of a servant. Notice beginning in 24 there, the attitude. He says, and the servant of the Lord must not strive. This is something I could be better at. I have gotten, I would like to think, a lot better than I once was. But it is something that I personally, Ron Gilbert, could improve. The servant of the Lord must not strive. We must try to help people be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, and patient. I know I'm better than I once was. That's still a room that's very large in me that I could improve. 
Notice some of the qualities of that. In meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. Sometimes you're going to have folks come to you and they're so mad at the world or they, they don't even know that they're actually even against themselves. They'll say one thing and then they'll say something other else trying to somehow come to grips with what's going on in their life and they're actually contradicting themselves. You know, I've, I've seen people get so angry and so upset that they, would, they said something to me one day, and then two days later, this, this, they're so upset and everything, and then they totally go against what they just said, and so you kind of remind them, well, do you not remember what you said yesterday? And, uh, and, but they're just confused. They're, they're in a war with themselves. And so a lot of times, you know, all you can do is kind of let them vent and so forth and try to encourage them and, and try to help them uh, and try definitely not to, to strive with them, but to be te- to teach and be patient in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. He says, if God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. Maybe you can work through this, and this person can be brought back, can be helped to see what's going on in their lives, work through it. In verse 26, and that they may recover themselves out of the stare of the devil. Here you have another class of individuals. One is uh, against themselves. Here you have one that's been, that's totally left the faith, if you will. So notice the submission of a servant. You've got to have the submission of a servant. You must have a, the right attitude. And that's one of the things as we look at that char- Christian character verbiage, you know, words we're going to be going through for the next, uh, well, we've got seven more. Uh, these are things that help us with our attitude, mercy and love, and then we'll be looking at has some others got to have the right attitude. Aim, aim that is righteous. What's the end game? What am I trying to do here? Am I trying to win this argument? Am I trying to show this man, hey, I'm more of a man than you, or I'm macho or what? Or am I trying to win this family, this man, to God? Am I trying to be God's man here and do and do what's right? And boy, sometimes those uh, you can lose sight of that. Try to keep that in front of you. I'm trying to do what's right. Notice the service which we give benefits one who is the Lord. If you behave this way, if you can keep your attitude and work towards it, that's perfect, but that's what we're trying to do. You're going to benefit from that. You're going to benefit. You're going to be a better person. You're going to be better able to help others. It's just you're going to grow, and it's going to make you better. Not only does it benefit, benefit the one who is the Lord's, but it also benefits the one's lost, the one that you're trying your best even though sometimes it doesn't seem like it's doing much good, but you're trying, and there is a blessing for them in that if they'll accept it. So you're going to benefit the one who's lost, and last but not least, you're going to benefit the one who's gone, the one who's gone and lost and, and tries to come back. Notice verse 26, and they that and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. In other words, somebody... Who's not? Who has fallen away? Who's not what they ought to be? So, three different types there. Fit yourself. You benefit fit those who are just absolutely lost. Help bring them to the Christ. And thirdly, you help those who are struggling with these things uh, in their lives. So, very quickly, a summation. And you know, it's a lot of verbiage. I know we stuck a lot in tonight. Chapter two is huge. And there's so many things involved with it. And I really didn't want to break it down because the first part of the chapter ties in so well with the second part. That if you do one one week and the second the other week, you kind of lose to me the how how it flows. So the dedication that a soldier, the things he must go through, the athlete, and how he must apply the rules, the farmer, and how he has to be patient. Confidence of a believer because of the great promises we have. Need to have the skill of a workman, and those duties are important. We need to have our best effort. And the cleanliness of the vessel. You can't do what you're supposed to do if you're not what you ought to be as far as the vessel. So There's things we need to separate, and we have to have the attitude of a servant. And that service that we give will benefit us, the lost, and those who who need to come home. If you're here tonight, you're not a Christian. Boy, let me tell you something. Uh, You need to be. You need to be. We talked a little while ago about a bodily resurrection. Just as sure as I'm standing here, one day we will be standing before the judgment seat of Christ, and you may have been dead for years. But let me tell you something, if you've been dead for years, the Bible also teaches us all that time you've been dead till we stand before Christ, you'll already know your destiny because you'll either be in a place called torment 
or you'll be in a place called Abraham's bosom of paradise. What do I mean by that? The moment you die, the Bible teaches that you don't even hardly lose consciousness. And you're in one of these two places. The, the rich man and Lazarus, Jesus is quite frank, that Lazarus died and was escorted by angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man, it says, was buried and opened his eyes, being in torments. What are they doing? They're waiting for the judgment day. Their, uh, their fate is sealed. One's only going to be on the left hand. One's going to be on the right. One's going to be with the goats. Already is. The other's going to be with the sheep. Their destiny is sealed because in this life, when we make this decision, you wake up like the rich man and you're in torments, about the best you're going to do is maybe holler at somebody on the other side and say, could you dip your finger in some water and cool my tongue because I am tormented in this flame. And Abraham would say to you, just as he said to the rich man, there's a great gulf fix. We can't come to you. You can't come to us. And then, while your fate is sealed, you know, because I think a lot of people think, well, you know, I'll be dead for a thousand years. It won't matter. It, you know, then we'll work that out when we get there. No, it ain't going to be like that. You're going to, uh, judgment's already there. I don't know how fast it's going to pass. I would say uh, a couple of days in torments would seem like an eternity, but it won't be. It's still going. But then we're talking about those places being emptied and all standing before the judgment seat of Christ and giving account of the things done in this body seems to me that basically what you have there is a sentencing. Those on the left hand, depart from me, you work with iniquity. Those to the right, welcome to the joys of the Lord. What side do you want to be on? Well, no doubt about it. Since I was that tall, I could tell you which side I wanted to be on. Hell scared me to death. Still does. I don't want to go. It's not made for me. God said, you got no business there. I made that for the devil and his angels. If you go there, it'd be because you want to go. I made heaven for you. That's where you need to go. What did he say? Do. Obey the gospel. Believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Be willing to stand before men and confess that, having repented of your sins, be baptized for the remission of your sins. That's exactly what the apostles told people in the first century. Do that, and you'll be what they were, which is New Testament Christians with the hope of eternal life. 